I'm sorry to hurry members, but we've only a few minutes in hand for interventions. So the next item of business is a debate on motion 16013 in the name of Daniel Johnson on justice. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Daniel Johnson to speak to and move the motion. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Legitimacy of the justice system relies on people understanding how it works and having confidence in the decisions it makes. Without consistency and transparency in sentencing, it is impossible for those very serious decisions to be understood both by the person being sentenced and perhaps more importantly by the victims and wider society who look to the courts to ensure that justice is served. That is why I am pleased to move the motion in my name because I fear that our justice system still has distance to travel in both consistency and transparency. Today's debate is prompted by the Christopher Daniel case in which an individual was found guilty of sexual assault but was granted leniency by the sheriff and was given an absolute discharge. The reasons given were that the offence was the result of, and I quote, inappropriate curiosity rather than for the purpose of sexual gratification. The sheriff also referred to the future career of the accused and the fact that the complainer appeared to have suffered, and again I quote, no injuries or long lasting effects. And it's worth reiterating those because the summary judgment has been taken down from the website. Parliament needs to take care in providing commentary on individual court cases, but I believe this case raises some fundamental points with regard to the factors that are appropriate to be taken into consideration when sentencing an individual both in the particular uh, 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 case, but also more broadly for serious crimes such as sexual assault. There are three important issues I think arise from this case. The accused circumstances and prospects, intention involved in the crime, and finally, the outcome of that crime. Taking the first issue, I would pose the question in this way. Is it right for an individual's career prospects and st or standing in the community to be grounds for leniency? Should it make a difference if an individual is a medical student rather than a modern apprentice when they are being sentenced? I personally struggle to understand how or why this should be a reason for leniency and in particular for the most serious of crimes. More importantly, how can it be fair or just to sentence someone on the basis of the life chances they have had to date? It cannot be right that two individuals receive different sentences for the same crime because of whether or not they were lucky in the lottery of life. The second issue poses the following question. What is the balance between intent and outcome when considering culpability for a crime, and in particular, sexual offences? Intent is an important consideration when looking at responsibility or guilt for wrongdoing, but lack of intent cannot try, trump that outcome. More importantly, the nature of sexual crimes is such that uh, what was intended is largely a secondary consideration because the act itself is so serious and so heinous. Whatever the motivation, sexual assault is a serious crime. Finally, to what degree is harm to be taken into account in sentencing and how should that be judged? Clearly, the outcome is important in both assessing guilt and sentencing. However, this is particularly difficult, uh, a particularly difficult issue with regard to sexual crimes as the damage caused is often very complicated, hard to detect, and often does not manifest itself for many years after the crime itself has taken place. So the answers to these questions are, of course, complex, as is the consideration of them. And of course, judgments made in a court and sentencing in particular are complex in and of themselves. No two set of circumstances are identical. Judicial discretion and independence are therefore vital in the exercise of justice. But consistency of consideration too is vital. And those considerations should be clear to all. It is for this precise reason that the Scottish Sentencing Council was created. As Lord McFadden put it in the report that led to its creation, and I quote, it is generally accepted that there should be consistency in sentencing at every level of our courts. That is an aspect of fairness and justice. These principles demand that similar crimes committed in similar circumstances by offenders whose circumstances are similar should attract similar sentences. That's the end of the quote. Indeed, 
The aims of the Council are to promote consistency in sentencing, assist in the development of sentencing policy, and promote greater awareness and understanding of sentencing. This is a vital function in our justice system. Our quarrel is therefore not with the purpose or the scope of the Council. The problem is the time it is taking to implement. Lord McFadden's words were published in 2006, 13 years ago. A body to develop sentencing guidelines was first consulted on by the then Scottish office in 1994. The reality is, is that we have been discussing the need for sentencing guidelines for more than 25 years. In the three and a half years since it was created, the Scottish Sentencing Council has only produced one guideline. By comparison, the Sentencing Guideline Council, as it was then, produced five publications relating to guidance on sentencing in their first three years. Indeed, the Scottish Sentencing Council's approach and function was modelled on its counterpart in England and Wales. And so it was not starting from a blank sheet of paper. It would not be unreasonable for us to expect to have made more progress to date. Of course, guidance on sentencing must not be rushed and must be, careful to subject, uh, must be subject to careful consideration and reflection. But I think it is right that we ask questions as to whether its progress has been adequate. Under the 2010 Criminal Justice and Licensing Act that created the Council, ministers have the power to request the Council examine particular issues and bring forward guidance. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary today what engagement he has had with the Council and whether he has considered using this power, and indeed particularly has he requested that guidance be brought forward on these matters. The prosecution of sexual crime is an issue we need to take very seriously. For too long, these crimes did not receive uh, 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 justice and the, si the system did not treat them or the crimes appropriately or effectively. We've made much progress, reflected in the significantly increased volume of such cases now reaching court. As much as 80% of the workload of the High Court now relates to serious sexual crimes. But for as long as we do not have a consistent approach to sentencing, and for as long as the government does not use the powers it has to bring forward guidelines for these serious crimes, we will be continuing to let victims and their families down. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Hamza Yusuf to speak to and move Amendment 1601.3.3. Cabinet Secretary, five minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Daniel Johnson for bringing this debate uh, to, to the Chamber. I listened to what he had to say carefully, took a, a number of notes, and if I don't come to his points in the opening uh, speech, certainly in my closing speech and summing up, uh, I will do my best to address as many of his and, and, and those around the Chamber's points. But I think uh, I find myself agreeing with a lot of what Don, Daniel Johnson said. Uh, some of it I would, I would take some, uh, perhaps a different view on, and, and again, I will, I will come to that. But I find myself agreeing uh, with a lot of, of what was said. And at the heart of this debate is fairness. Fairness is absolutely critical. Fairness uh, for those who are victims of crimes and their families, of course, uh, but also importantly for the cornerstone of our uh, democracy and the rule of law, fairness to those who are accused too uh, of, of, of criminal offences. Uh, all too often, those who have been victims of crimes tell me that they do not feel that the victim's voice is heard right throughout the criminal justice system. And there's a lot of work that I am doing to try to rebalance uh, some of that. Um, I will turn to the Victims Task Force perhaps later if I have time, but let me address the, 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 the substance of the motion put forward by Daniel Johnson in relation to the Sentencing uh, Council. Uh, Daniel Johnson is absolutely right. The Sentencing Council were given responsibility for promoting consistency in sentencing practice, uh, assisting the development of policy in relation to sentencing but also importantly, promoting greater, greater awareness and understanding of sentencing policy and practice. And I welcome the work of the Council in progressing their work to meeting these objectives. A lot of focus already of the debate, and, and no doubt will on the debate, be around uh, the guidance that has been produced and the work that is underway. I think it's really important for me to, to say from the offset, uh, right from the outset, that Producing guidelines, of course, is, is guidelines, sentencing guidelines is, in, is an integral part of the work that the Sentencing Council do. But they do more than just producing sentencing guidelines. They do work on research, of course, around sentencing, work on raising awareness of sentencing. They have some fantastic online materials. They have work uh, materials that they have sent to schools around sentencing and the complexity of sentencing, as well as with victims uh, of crime uh, as well. Notwithstanding that, 
I understand and, and the Parliament will make its voice known around um, the, the, the progress they wish to see on particular guidelines. Of course, I heard him when he said that the victim's voice should be heard throughout the justice system. Can you explain how the victim's voice is heard in the Sentencing Council? Because I've read all three annual reports and it's not referenced anywhere. Cabinet Secretary. So one of the reasons why guidelines can take a bit of time to come to fruition is because public consultation is a key part of that. In fact, in the first meeting of the Sentencing Council, uh, it was determined that every single guideline that they produce will then go to public consultation. So there's a public consultation for the guidelines in the same way that there would be for legislation, hopefully uh, people could, could, could potentially input, including victims of crime uh, in, in, into that. Um, I just want to also focus on, on, on the point about the independent judiciary. I think that's really important that Daniel Johnson uh, touched upon. I just want to, to emphasize that. It is of course for the courts to make decisions on sentencing. One case has already been referenced, other cases may well be referenced. Uh, during this debate, uh, but it's important to say that it's absolutely right that politicians, and in particular government, do not interfere uh, in those decisions uh, that uh, are made. Yes, I will. Jenny Mara. I would absolutely agree with what the Cabinet Secretary just said, that politicians should not interfere with judicial independence. But does he agree that we've got a duty to question when a sentence handed down is so out of kilter with public expectation? Cabinet Secretary. Y yes, I think accountability is different to independence. I think independence is absolutely uh, a cornerstone uh, and a fundamental cornerstone of the, the judiciary and rule of law. But that does not mean that our judiciary are, are not accountable. And Parliament has every right. This debate is an example of, 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 of that accountability. Um, and as I say, uh, I think it's important that this debate, uh, of course, uh, takes place. I'm conscious of, of the lack of time uh, that I have. Um, I just wanted to read a quote directly from Lady Dorian, because I think this issue of guidelines taking time is important, particularly when it comes to sexual offences. Uh, all of us have, a, have a, I think, a shared endeavour to improve the experience of victims of sexual offences, in particular because of the trauma uh, that they face. But it also is important that we get these guidelines right and not rushed. And I quote directly from Lady Dorian from her news release uh, in, in response to this debate and this motion that she released yesterday. And I, and I quote, with regard to the timing of the Council's work programme, we recognise the desire to have sentencing guidelines in place as quickly as possible. However, the potential impact of guidelines which have not been properly considered and tested is considerable both for the individual cases and for the justice system as a whole. That's why we took an early decision that our work should be evidence-based, involving appropriate levels of research and consultation, including public consultation on all guidelines. We have committed to taking the necessary time to understand current practice, to look at what works and why, and to listen to those involved in and affected by sentencing decisions, including victims. Um, I'm aware that um, running out of time and I'll have to uh, perhaps uh, listen to the debate carefully of course and, and respond to members uh, from across the chamber. Uh, I cannot support uh, most of the, the amendments uh, from Liam Kerr and again I will come to that but uh, it is uh, I think uh, because uh, the, 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 the uh, reference to unduly lenient and removing that I think would have considerable uh, effects but perhaps I can come to that in the closing uh, of, of my, of my uh, remarks. But I look Thank forward you. to Please what I think will be a very amendment. good debate uh, and I will listen carefully and respond in my closing. Please move your own, I don't know if you've moved your amendment, Captain oh, Secretary. Oh yes, I've moved the amendment in my Thank amendment. you very much. Now before I call Liam Kerr, uh, I think there's a, a couple of members who apparently want to speak but don't want to press the request to speak button. It's a good idea to do both. I call Liam Kerr to speak to move amendment 16013.2. Mr Kerr, four minutes strictly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start by saying we'll support the Labour motion at decision time. Transparency and consistency are fundamental but they are not there right now because Given that sentences are routinely and sometimes automatically shortened, people simply don't understand how long an offender will actually spend in prison. And the president of the Society of Solicitors recently suggested that the Scottish court system could be more open than it is. And as Daniel Johnson rightly says, the Christopher Daniel judgment appears to make clear that leniency may be a function not of the crime, but whether or not the sentencer believes the criminal is respectable and has a bright future. Now, I've read the Scottish Sentencing Council's response to this debate yesterday, and I agree that using individual cases as the rationale for changing sentencing policy would be unlikely to promote consistency, predictability, or transparency. But I respectfully suggest that that is the job of the Scottish Sentencing Council. And people may feel 
that after four years of existence running on a 16-year-old English model which released four such guidelines within its first three years, the time for results is now. Turning to our amendment, which I hereby move, President Officer, I was horrified and baffled by the sentence in the Christopher Daniel case. I and many members of the public found it difficult to comprehend how a legal adult could be found guilty of repeatedly sexually assaulting a six-year-old, yet receive an absolute discharge, which, for the record, basically means there is no punishment and no criminal record. Now, the Law Society's briefing helpfully says the reasons for an absolute discharge vary, but could include the circumstances of the crime, the offender's previous good character, the crime was very minor, the accused was very young. Surely none of these, even if applicable here, override the established facts in this case. Now, crucially, the Crown lodged an appeal against the sentence and then withdrew it, all of which led to a significant and justified public outcry, grounded in the feeling that a young victim and her family have been let down by our justice system. Now, I wrote to the Lord Advocate and asked for clarity on the disposal, a review of the decision and process, and reconsideration of the decision not to appeal. And I'm very grateful to the Lord Advocate for his detailed reply. And it's his view on the Crown's ability to appeal a sentence that is of most interest to my amendment. Because the ability to appeal is limited to two grounds, on a point of law or that the sentence is unduly lenient. Now that unduly lenient test is the real crux and the key lies in the word unduly because the test is based on a 1995 case that mandates that a sentence is only unduly lenient if, to paraphrase, it falls out with the range of reasonable sentences in the circumstances. If a disposal is not unduly lenient, the Crown's hands are tied. And that leads me to conclude, as I've set down in the amendment, that the Crown's ability to appeal sentences may be hampered by an overly restrictive test of undue leniency. And therefore, it is entirely reasonable to ask the Scottish Law Commission, whose remit, remember, is to recommend reforms to improve, simplify and update the law of Scotland to investigate and to consider whether the test of undue leniency requires reform because it is vital that prosecutors have the tools to appeal sentences that do not deliver justice. President officer, the Lord Advocate rightly states sentencing is entirely a matter for judge or sheriff. We all agree that politicians should not interfere with the independence of the judiciary. But politicians do set out the parameters for sentencing. Indeed, the SNP will shortly seek to implement a presumption against sentences of less than 12 months. And thus it does accept that politicians have a role in how sentencing and therefore appeals operate. There is a role for politicians in ensuring our justice system meets the needs of victims and society. And it is crucial that victims understand and have faith in our system and we would be failing surely in our duty if when a perpetrator has walked free having been found guilty of sexually assaulting a six-year-old girl we do not empower the Scottish Law Commission to review whether the undue leniency test is overly restrictive. Parliament should vote for the amendment in my name to require them to do so. Thank you very much. You. I call on John Finney. Four minutes, please, Mr Finney. Um, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Um, the Scottish Green Party had put forward an amendment in my name and that amendment primarily uh, concentrated on the issue of judicial training. Now, um, it, it did include elements that the, the other parties have included, that transparency and uh, consistency are fundamental, uh, and a noting of recent cases. But I have to be honest with you and say, I have some discomfort about that, because we can all read newspapers and see causes, uh, cases and, and query uh, the, the disposal. And I can think of a, a case in my own area, indeed, that I, I was involved in the periphery of supporting the individual, where I'm deeply unhappy with it. However, I wasn't in court throughout the entire proceedings and yes there will always be cases uh, on the extremity and one of them may well have been alluded to uh, where uh, issues are, are brought sharply into to focus. The, the cabinet secretary in his short time mentioned the victims task force and I have to say what uh, I'm impressed with is the seniority of people involved in that and hopefully that's indicative of a willingness to have action. Everyone wants to have regard to the, the well-being of um, uh, victims, and, and I'm no different, my party's no different, nor am I beyond criticising the, the judiciary, indeed, did so in detail last year with wholly inappropriate comments from a High Court judge during an appeal about, uh, which perpetrated a number of stereotypes and myths about domestic violence. The motion in Daniel Johnson's name talks about concern, and indeed uh, the Scottish Government note that, uh, about the, the Sentencing Council. And, uh, I thought it was quite interesting that we did not only get uh, a copy of the letter that was sent to Mr Johnson, but also a news release. And that's been alluded to in part by 
the Cabinet Secretary. And in the very short time, I'm not going to be able to, to uh, repeat many of the elements of it I would like to. But potential impact on sentencing guidelines being introduced, which have not been properly considered and tested, would be considerable. I think they would be considerable. I think they would be deeply considerable. And stressing the importance of taking an evidence-based approach invo involving appropriate levels of research and consultation. Yes, indeed. Daniel Jones. I thank the member for giving me the, the point is not to fast track, but to prioritise these matters in sentencing guidelines. I just emphasise that. John Finney. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, you, you know, also reference has been made to Lady Dorian, and, and, and colleagues on the Justice Committee spoke quite rightly in re uh, reverent terms about her involvement with her case notes regarding the ongoing. Uh, examination we have of the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill with regard to ground rules, healings and evidence by commission. And I think it's important, therefore, that we listen to some of the things she says. And uh, um, the, the principles and purpose of sentence, the reasons for sentence decisions must be stated clearly and openly as circumstances permit, and that sentence decisions should treat similar cases in a similar way, assisting consistency and predictability. Now, um, this idea that all cases uh, are unique, we, we're very familiar with the sc scenario that all of us here will rep represent our, our constituents um, e uh, in the same way, equally. But it doesn't mean we treat them the same way. Obviously, we have different regard to the individual circumstances of the case. A, a frail older person that requires help uh, will be treated differently from a very uh, articulate uh, younger person, perhaps. So that applies. That uh, applies very much in the case of judicial examination. We've seen, for instance, that where there's been an over-focus on an individual case, risk aversion comes in. And I talk about the focus on a particular case and how that impacted the management of the uh, offenders and the significant downturn uh, in, in uh, the uh, number of people being granted that. So I welcome, for instance, the domestic abuse legislation is coming on track. The input from Scottish Women's Aid to the judiciary on that is very welcome. Our motion talked about not only judicial training, but judicial training uh, advised by external individuals. Uh, I think that's very important. I have some concerns about the nature of some of this debate here, but of course everyone wants to see informed decision making from an evidence basis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I call Liam Kerr. Mr Kerr. I don't know where I am today. Liam MacArthur. Sorry, Mr. Kerr and Mr. MacArthur, to mix you up. Mr. MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Officer, um, can I start by thanking Daniel Johnson for bringing this debate uh, on sentences? Uh, I'm conscious in the limited time available, it's going to be difficult to get into the, the complexities of some of the issues uh, thrown up, but I think it serves a very useful pur uh, purpose nonetheless. As um, Mr. Johnson highlighted, the, the catalyst to some extent has been the, the recent case involving. Uh, Christopher Daniel uh, granted an absolute uh, discharge uh, after being found guilty for sexually assaulting a six-year-old uh, child, a, a case that is understandably, or a judgment that's understandably given rise uh, to widespread public uh, anxiety. It's a case that raises serious questions, and as we seek to grapple with those questions, we can't lose sight of the fact that at the heart of this is a family coming to terms with an extremely traumatic experience. And they deserve transparency. Um, they will also, I think, be questioning the consistency of a ruling that does seem, as others have said, uh, at odds uh, with uh, precedent. And of course, I think John Finney is right, no one in this chamber uh, is privy to the uh, full knowledge and details of this particular case. All of us absolutely respect uh, the importance of preserving and defending uh, judicial discretion uh, and independence. Equally, however, as the McFadden report in 2006, which gave rise to the Scottish Sentencing Council, acknowledged, and this is a reversal of the quote from Daniel Johnson, a perception of inconsistency in, senten in sentencing is likely to lead to a loss of public confidence in the, criminal, in the justice system. It went on to argue that guidelines would promote and encourage consistency of approach and thus improve consistency in sentencing while preserving the important element of judicial discretion. Uh, this consistency is key not just for the accused but crucially for victims and the wider public. Now, I fully accept that the, the process of developing such guidelines does take time. Lady Dorian is absolutely uh, correct and insistent that guidelines need to be evidence-based and subject to the widest possible scrutiny. She's right to, to remind us of the impact they have, not just in individual cases, but on the wider justice system as a whole. However, it does feel uh, as if progress to date has been slow, with little expectation of this changing in the near uh, future. And without diminishing the importance of the work that the uh, Council is currently undertaking, the prospect of no guidelines on sexual offences being ready until after 2021 20, uh, 
potentially some way after 2021, I think it's right that this Parliament um, raises its concerns in that uh, regards. Could I just make a brief mention of uh, the issue of, of short sentences? I was um, uh, disturbed to note that the second most frequent custodial sentence length um, was for three months or less in 2017-2018 at the same time that community payback orders were dropping by 15% and 10% fall in the overall number of community sentences. And I welcome the, 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 the decision the government's announced in terms of a presumption against sentences of 12 months, but I'd be interested to know the involvement of the Sentencing Council in ensuring that that presumption uh, does have a meaningful impact on the ground. Uh, Deputy President, Officer, I, I think as everybody so far that has spoken has acknowledged consistency and transparency lie at the very heart of public confidence in our justice system. I think at present uh, there is more, potentially much more, that needs to be done uh, with some urgency to ensure that greater consistency and transparency. And on that basis, I support the uh, motion in Daniel Johnson's name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate. There's no time in hand, so it's four minutes. Speeches, Jenny Mara, to be followed by Rona Mackay. Presiding officer, I was shocked by the sentence passed down in the Christopher Daniel case, as were many members of the public, and would like to address my remarks to that case this afternoon. But can I start by noting the confusion in the Scottish judiciary <coughs> today over the sentencing statement prepared by Sheriff Sinclair on this case? I was told today that the statement had been removed from the website, Scottish Judiciary website, at the end of last week by their communications team. When I asked why this was, the Scottish Judiciary Service said that it was policy to remove the Sheriff's statement after a period of time in cases of absolute discharge. But today at 12.30 p.m. there was a note on a case of rape where the result was absolute discharge dated March 2017, two years ago. When I inquired why this was, I was told that this probably should have been removed and that they are currently reviewing their policy on when to unpublish statements, but that they unpublished the Daniel statement late last week for certain reasons which are still being signed off. Presiding officer, you'll see my concern at the lack of transparency here and the strange timing of the removal of the sentencing statement in this case. I hope the Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate will look into this matter and reassure Parliament about the reason for this removal and that policy is appropriate, transparent and being followed correctly. I'd like to turn to the case itself. Why were the public so shocked about this case? And why are these guidelines needed as soon as possible? Because a little girl was put through the process of giving evidence on the sexual abuse she suffered, only for the sheriff to dismiss the impact this abuse would have on her life. And I quote him, it was fortunate that the complainer appeared to have suffered no injury or long lasting effects. As her mother said, how can the sheriff know that? Survivors of childhood sexual abuse have said in the past that the effects of abuse can take years to manifest themselves. And I think there is general recognition of that. So why would a sheriff make such a remark? The parents of this little girl put their trust in our justice system and took the very difficult decision for any parent for their child to provide evidence. But the sentence from the sheriff's own statement seems completely based on the accused's own motivation and career prospects. I quote again, the sheriff considered that the offence to be the result of an entirely inappropriate curiosity rather than for the purpose of sexual gratification. And also on his career prospects, any recorded conviction for this offence would have serious consequences in terms of the accused's future career. And goes on to say, I quote again, that this was a relevant factor in deciding how to deal with the case, because any sentence would mean that he would probably be unable to continue his university course. This is quite astonishing. Is justice blind today? As many commentators have said, including Scottish rape crisis, would similar consideration have been given to an accused whose career was not mapped out in this way? For an unemployed 18-year-old, for a young man without a caring and supportive family, to use the sheriff's words, would he have escaped the sexual offences register too? For is that not the purpose of our justice system and the sexual offences register, that people who sexually abuse are registered and restricted appropriately? Further confusion arises on the appeal. I understand that the Crown dropped the appeal on reading the Sheriff's sentencing statement. For me, the statement raises more questions than it answers. 
I heard from Liam Kerr's contribution that a case review is not possible because of strict reading of undue leniency. Presiding officer, I think it's appropriate for Parliament to ask the Lord Advocate for clarity to Parliament on why this case cannot be reviewed. The fact, I think this is a wholly unsatisfactory situation and I think Parliament should demand clarity from the Lord Advocate to give public confidence for this family but also across Scotland in cases of childhood sexual abuse. Presiding officer, the final point I would I, like to, to make is, is it appropriate for any sheriff, not just Sheriff Sinclair in this case, to be Chief Executive of the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission? Is there not an inherent conflict right. of interest in that Thank dual you. role? Thank you. I have been a little more lenient, uh, but I can't keep that up. Rona Mackay, followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I agree with the sentiment of Daniel Johnson's motion. Transparency and consistency are fundamental to ensuring that victims and wider society's interests are served by our justice system. And I also acknowledge the point that it has taken three and a half years for the Scottish Sentencing Council to produce a set of sentencing guidelines uh, and that the definitive guidelines on sexual assaults will not be available until after 2021. However, guidelines in a subject of such importance is a complicated and intense process. Those guidelines must be evidence-based, involving appropriate levels of research and consultation, including public consultation, but there are valid points being made about the length of time it's taken. However, the consequences of rushing through new guidelines could have a wide-reaching impact on the justice system in Scotland. As Lady Dorian, Chair of the Sentencing Council, says, each case is unique and one size does not fit all, so variations in sentencing will happen depending on that, the particular circumstances of the case. So we can't use decisions in individual cases as the rationale for sentencing policy. That said, the public must have confidence in our justice system and I would like to associate myself with everything Jenny Mara just said. Um, the, the Christopher Daniels case was shocking and inexplicable, and I think we do need some answers uh, from that decision. However, the Sentencing Council is holding two consultation exercises this year, seeking public views on their draft guidelines on the sentencing process. The consultation will set out the various steps taken by judges and factors which may be taken into account in making sentences, decisions and in the sentencing of young people. The focus for guidelines on sexual offences, which is absolutely crucial given the rise in crimes in, of this type, will also be available shortly, although naturally this is a very sensitive and complex area. Work has begun on this consultation with a wide range of stakeholders, including victim support organisations, and it's likely that the Council will develop multiple guidelines on sexual offending. Presiding officer, we know that the independence of the judiciary is paramount, and everyone agrees we don't want minister, ministerial control over decisions being made. However, how sentence decisions are reached by individual judges, in particular cases where children are involved and are perceived not to be in the child's best interest, should and must come under scrutiny. Uh, I firmly believe, uh, with John, agree with John Finney and, and the Green Motion that specialist training, well, I believe it should be mandatory for judges dealing with sexual crimes and crimes involving children and I would appreciate the Minister's con comments on this in his closing speech. Presiding officer, I believe that the Sentencing Council is aware of the public feeling and the emphasis being put on this issue cross-party in the Chamber today, and I really do hope they are listening. The bottom line is transparency and consistency in sentencing are vitally important, but getting it right has to be paramount. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corry to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Corry, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the justice debate, the debate today. Now, justice system in Scotland is something that we, as members of this society, need to have the utmost confidence in. We need to continuously ensure that we have a credible and reliable system. And within this, how sentencing works is crucial to fueling this public confidence. Right now, this confidence is in danger of eroding. And the case at the forefront of my mind, as I know of my colleagues here, is that of the Christopher Daniel case and sentencing. This conviction for sexual assault of a six-year-old over two years saw the bizarre decision made by the sentencing judge that the perpetrator face no, need not face any punishment nor have his name added to the sex offender's register, as already been stated. The immaturity, education attainment, and future prospects of the perpetrator were placed before a six-year-old victim's right to justice. And of course, each case is unique and needs to be considered as such. But surely the question is, what kind of precedent does this set for future offenders? We need to get the sentencing right, 
Of course, it needs to be fair to the perpetrators, but equally, it needs to be fair to the victims. And this case has raised serious questions and concerns. And more often than not, it is the victim who risks, risks being damaged by the court's process. Surely it is in the interest of the victim, first and foremost, as well as the public, that cases such as this can go to appeal. Of course, it is important to remember judges hold the authority to sentence as they see fit. And I do not question their experience, nor their having the advantage to listen to all the evidence in court informing their decision making. Yet despite this, the cases we have seen have raised the question of how possible it is to appeal under the law on undue leniency. If anything, incidents such as the Daniel case suggest that perhaps the criteria of undue leniency should be improved, as my colleague Leon Kerr has mentioned already. And surely an a serious assault conviction that results in an absolute discharge is reason enough for exploring the reform of a system that seems to present too many restrictions. It would be the door to fairer outcomes that give just punishment to perpetrators while emphasizing the considerable and considerate care for victims. Connected with this, the importance of published sentencing guidelines would help make our justice system be somewhat more dependable than has been under the current SNP government. The establishment of the Scottish Sentencing Council in 2015 was most welcome, but it has been over three years since this arri its arrival that, and there has not yet been any extensive guidelines published. And I understand that the research behind this needs to take many complexities into account. And of course, this must be done with care and robustness. But nevertheless, a delay in publishing them is concerning. And it is, in fact, it is the fact that these guidelines may not be finalized until 2021. Delays such as this are only part of the reason why sentencing in this justice system so often lacks transparency and openness. And worryingly, it has become common practice for offenders to be granted early release into the community. Indeed, for those who are sentenced to under four years in prison, they are released automatically halfway through that time. In many cases, these offenders can live in the community without supervision, and the frequency of these early releases fosters confusion as to how effective our sentencing system truly is. Moreover, the community sentencing pathway, which often, uh, which, just one minute, uh, which often uh, breaches, or, breaches of order does no favours to restoring justice and the belief of our communities in our justice process. Yes, I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary, briefly. I'm, I'm trying not to get too political in this debate, but I, you know, I just wonder if Maurice Corey will recognise that automatic early release, of course, for long-term prisoners was ended by the SNP and was introduced by the Conservative government. Maurice Corey. Well, I understand that, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, but remember, things move on and things change in different cases, and the severity of the cases obviously dictate how they should be dealt with. So I don't think one rule fits all, and, and things do change. But to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, sentencing within our justice system is clearly far from perfect, and without a tougher approach, perpetrators can escape a just answer to their crime. And I support the argument for greater transparency and more established consistency. To achieve this, we need more effective sentencing guidelines supported by reformed criteria to target lenient sentences. Surely, this, it is, this is how public confidence, confidence in this justice system in Scotland can be restored. Thank you. Thank you. Call Fulton McGregor, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, I want to start by saying that I understand that many cases are controversial or the circumstances are difficult, especially in terms of how cases are viewed by the wider public and a, a lot of the time with, with media input as well. And I can completely sympathise and understand the concerns uh, that many have in terms of individual sentencing cases. And I think that, that, that Jenny Mara in particular has summed up the circumstances of, uh, of the recent case, uh, which has been talked about in here. And I think it's fair to say that that, that the, the outcome in that case has shocked um, many of us. And I was at the cross-party group um, as a deputy convener uh, on adult survivors uh, of childhood sexual abuse uh, just last week. And um, the, the, the consequences for some of these agencies involved uh, in, in that work of that decision was talked about. And I think it's only fair that I take this opportunity as a member of that cross-party group uh, to put on record um, you know, agencies like the Moyer Anderson Foundation, for example, and their um, you know their, their feelings about that particular uh, sentencing um, and, and I think that it's one of the decisions of the group is actually to, to, to write to yourself Minister and, uh, um, and I think you're coming to visit the group at some point uh, and, and perhaps have a discussion about some of these issues um, but what I also want to go on and say is that I do, I do fully support the principle uh, that sentencing decisions in any criminal cases are matter solely for the judge to decide something that the, the, the minister said earlier. And such decisions are definitely not for politicians. They are for judges. And the ju judiciary in the court, Scotland Act, ensures that this is the case. 
And as MSPs in this Parliament, we must not obstruct the continued uh, independence of the judiciary. Well, I think that it's fine to, to express opinions as we, as, uh, as we have done, uh, and I think that everybody is, is united on that. Um, it's important uh, you know, that we recognise that there's indeed a system of accountability in place where the, the Crown Office have the ability to appeal against unduly lenient sentences. There are also sentencing guidelines in place, and if a judge does not follow this, they, they must state their reasons for doing so in the interest of transparency. Uh, in Scotland, sentencing um, guidelines came into force in October last year and were decided by an independent advisory body. The guidelines were improved, approved by the High Court and members of the public were consulted as to their feelings and the appropriateness of sentences being passed year. Yeah. Daniel Johnson. I thank the member for giving me, but he does recognise that there are no guidelines in place for them to comment against, and that's part of the problem. Fulton McGregor. I, I, I thank the minister. The, 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 um, <laughs> Hopefully never. Um, <laughs> I thank the member for that intervention. The guidelines themselves were scrutinised and put. I'm, I'm talking about the guidelines here uh, for Daniel Johnson. The guidelines themselves were scrutinised and put through several different processes before um, being approved. And, and obviously, as has been said already, the Scottish Sentencing Council are working towards producing sentencing guidelines at the current time, um, uh, and they're at an early stage. And this is not something that I don't think we can rush haphazardly. I come back to uh, the point from the previous speaker. That, um, uh, Maurice Corey there, you, you know, I think you know, there's no point in rushing haphazardly uh, into these decisions and I, I trust the Sentencing Council will do a thorough job to ensure that the guidelines cover a wide range of areas appropriately and ensure the extensive consultation and engagement is a key part of producing uh, these guidelines. And I don't think I need to, to give any uh, reassurance in this chamber, particularly for members of the, the Justice Committee like uh, Daniel Johnson, that the, that the SNP Scottish Government is fully committed to putting victims at the centre of the Justice um, system, you know, the, look at this, this, the bill we've, we're taking through just now in terms of the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill, an absolutely um, fantastic piece of legislation. Hopefully that will continue uh, to progress through all the various stages. We will continue to help victims and witnesses feel supported, safe and informed at every stage of the process. Uh, and I'm pleased that the Justice Secretary and the, the Lord Advocate co-chair the new Victims Task Force to improve um, victims' experiences of our justice system. I can see, uh, President Officer, that um, I'm, I'm coming to the end of, um, of my input. So I just want to conclude by saying that I agree with the, the Law Society that there's perhaps uh, some work to do involving both the public and victims in the overall process. Um, and I'll be supporting the Government. Um, Thank you. Call Kezia Dugdale, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. In preparation for this afternoon's debate, I went back to stage one of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Bill in the 23rd of June 2009, which created the Sentencing Council. And I refer and quote from Kenny McCaskill's remarks that day. He said, we believe that inconsistency in sentencing is a difficulty that must be dealt with. Equally, we believe that not only those who are given the privilege of sitting on the bench, but people who represent interest groups, such as victims' organisations, should be able to have some say. There is something manifestly wrong in our society if the views of a representative of a victim's organisation cannot be heard. That is why we believe there should be a sentencing council. So if the Cabinet Secretary will forgive me, I was disappointed in his response to my intervention because to say that a public consultation is enough to satisfy hearing the voices of victims in this process, I think that falls very far short of victims' expectation of this process. In the time that I have, which is limited, in the Cabinet Secretary will not be surprised to know that I intend to focus the rest of my remarks on the Woodburn family. And for the benefit of the rest of the chamber, this is the instance of Sean Woodburn, um, who was killed outside a pub in Leith on the 1st of January uh, 2017. And I've been working with the family uh, for over a year now, trying to examine different aspects of how the justice system failed them and their family, and indeed Sean's memory. I'm very grateful to the First Minister, to the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor, and indeed to Hamza Youssef for meeting with the family on several occasions and moving quickly on some subjects, such as the law with regards to post-mortems, hugely appreciative of the Lord Advocate's work in that regard. The Cabinet Secretary knows that I have a strong and passionate interest in delivering a Victims Commissioner. That's an issue for another day. He will also know I have concerns about the degree to which the Victims Code of Practice is shared with victims of crime. It's very hard to uh, access, it's very hard to get a hold of, but it is the guide to the fundamental rights that victims of crimes have. So, what I'd like to comment on now is the issue of sentencing, sentencing statements and the Sentencing Commission itself. 13 charges were brought against three people uh, for what happened that day on the 1st of January 2017. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, it resulted in just three convictions against one person, including a charge of culpable homicide. Murder was dropped. 
The overall sentence for that crime was four years. It was an incumulo sentence, which means the family to this day don't know what Sean's life was worth. There is not one single sum, a number of years, that count for what the charge of culpable homicide actually meant in the event of Sean's death. That's something the family have found really difficult to digest. And I was really taken with the comments from Liam Kerr around the issue of undue leniency. How can you even consider undue leniency when you don't understand what the particular charge equals in a case where you have an incumulo sentence. So there's a huge amount of work to be done there. I raised this case directly with the Lord President and I got a very interesting reply from Lord Carley, which detailed the rights that the Woodburn family had under the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act in 2014 to a sentencing statement. They had no idea they could request from uh, uh, Lady Stacey details of why the sentence was what it was. And when we got that information, it was to a degree hugely comforting. They still don't think four years is enough for their son's killer, but at least now they have a better understanding of why the judge took the decision that they did. The Woodburn family believe that sentencing statements should be mandatory in all cases, and I've got to say uh, I agree with them. But they're also outraged that after six years and £1.4 million worth of money, the Sentencing uh, Commission still have no plans whatsoever to produce new guidelines on either murder or culpable homicide. So when the family were told that the sentence was within the guidelines and no guidelines existed, they remain extremely angry about what they experienced. I've got seconds left, but if I can just say to the Cabinet Secretary, that he has the power under Section 7 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act to direct the Sentencing Council to consider guidelines in any particular crime. And I also know from other PQ answers that um, Michael Matheson, when he was the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, ruled out asking them to do uh, any sentencing guidelines for murder or culpable homicide. But I have a letter from this Cabinet Secretary saying he's, his mind is still open to that prospect. So can I ask him again today, please, will he use the power that he does have to instruct the Sentencing Council to move quickly to produce guidelines for uh, the crimes of murder and culpable homicide so that families don't have to experience what the Woodburns have? Thank you. I call Gordon Lindhurst, who followed by Shona Robinson. Mr Lindhurst. Deputy Presiding Officer, today's debate has attracted widespread interest and is perhaps most keenly of interest to victims of crime and their families who will be following what we say today. Unfortunately, as we have been hearing during today's debate, there has been a loss of confidence in the justice system. Now, suffering at the hands of an offender is a traumatic enough experience for many and can lead to lifelong physical and mental scars. But clearly, the justice system should not unnecessarily add to that trauma. Victims and their families should have the assurance that justice has been delivered in their case. But also, that justice is delivered consistently across the board, else the faith they have placed in the justice system, as well as the faith of others, will be undermined. And apparently inconsistent sentences for offenders can foster an initial sense of disbelief <coughs> that can sometimes lead to anger, to upset, to distrust. And this can indeed worsen if there's a lack of transparency in the system and it is perceived to place too heavy a reliance on judicial discretion. That discretion could be strengthened rather than weakened by clear and appropriate sentencing guidelines. Such guidelines can assist in providing consistency, but also act, as we've heard, as a basis for public understanding as to how decisions and sentences, at least in general terms, are reached. And throughout this afternoon, we've been hearing about cases that have led us to this debate today. Some have involved sexual offences, but other crimes have also been the subject of intense public scrutiny following the handing down of a sentence that is perceived to be too lenient. The Scottish Sentencing Council was set up more than three years ago, but is yet to issue any substantive guidelines. While those guidelines should of course be properly considered and tested, what is to happen in the interim? There is a saying that justice delayed is justice denied. Now while the same motto may not apply strictly speaking to sentencing guidelines, if it is agreed by everyone that these can provide a useful framework, then it would be helpful, more than helpful perhaps, for them to be provided without further undue delay. That would be in the interests of consistency, predictability and transparency, to use the Scottish Sentencing Council's words in its offering of views on this debate. 
for lack of transparency and consistency on sentencing can perpetuate the grief and the upset faced by people who have had to have dealings with the judicial system through absolutely no fault of their own. And as the Scottish Conservative Amendment highlights today, may, more work may also need to be done when it comes to the test of undue leniency. What may appear to a member of the public as an exceptionally soft sentence is not necessarily better understood by being simply categorised as not being unduly lenient. Deputy Presiding Officer, sentencing is far from an easy task. We all recognise that. And no two cases are ever exactly the same. Nevertheless, we must have a justice system that holds and maintains the public confidence. And it is clear from today's debate that some way needs to be travelled to reach that goal. Thank you. And I call Shona Robinson, last speaker in the open debate. Ms Robinson, please. Thank you, Deputy <coughs> President Officer. No one in this uh, chamber would disagree that transparency and consistency are vital to ensure victims and wider society's interests are served by the justice system. And I fully understand and appreciate the frustration at the time being taken in issuing guidance on uh, specific crimes. The Sentencing Council's work programme is uh, progressing with a meeting to be held, as I understand, this Friday. And hopefully uh, they will have gathered from the, the comments across this chamber that there is a, a scrutiny now uh, upon them to, uh, to make some pace. However, the reality, as others have said, is that the, the process in developing guidelines uh, does take time. The Council states that while recognising that the public's desire to have guidelines in place quickly, the potential impact of not carrying out the necessary due diligence could be considerable for individual cases in the justice system as a whole, a point well made by John Finney. So these can be difficult things to reconcile. Yes, of course. Daniel Johnson. The Sentencing Council in England and Wales produces around three guidelines a year. Are they rushing their guidelines? Turner well, Robinson. I wouldn't want to say they were rushing their guidelines, but I think it would be wrong of us to ignore the due diligence required in developing, and of course the complexity, which I know the member does understand, in developing these guidelines. But where I would agree with them is that the fact we're having this debate and the fact there has been a consensus across this chamber that pace needs to be made, I think will not go unrecognised by uh, the Council. There does need to be wide engagement with uh, criminal justice and victim support organisations, third sector groups, academia as well, as of course, of course as the judiciary uh, throughout the process. So it's fundamental that the research is evidence-based, properly consulted upon and every area thoroughly scrutinised uh, prior to issue issuing any finalised uh, sentencing uh, guidance. Uh, after the, the um, la Lady Dorian, uh, the uh, Lord Justice Clark and the Chair of the Scottish Sentencing Council has stated uh, that uh, the, those first guidelines will see the transparency in sentencing increase. It would uh, also form a strong foundation for future work in the development of further sentencing guidelines, particularly uh, specific offences such as sexual uh, offences. Law is of course a complex area which is uh, why it is right and proper uh, to, to get uh, this right. Late last year uh, I met with Sheriff uh, Norman McFadden and Graham uh, Ackerman from the Scottish Sentencing Council to discuss the Council's plans to develop sentencing guidelines for sexual offences including offences against children. That meeting uh, coincided with the, the Dundee Evening Telegraph's Our Kids Need Justice campaign, which arose out of some particularly concerning local cases. It is a campaign that struck a chord across the city, and I think it shows the public's interest uh, in this matter. Now, I've raised uh, these issues directly with the Lord Advocate and the Justice Secretary, and I was encouraged that the Council is beginning to think about holding wider public consultation events and I've encouraged them to hold one in Dundee to give not just local people a, a say in the framing of the guidance but also to lay out a little bit more about the complexity of these matters and being able to discuss directly with the public uh, these issues. Now, uh, they have uh, confirmed that they'll be holding consultation uh, events during uh, the year, uh, and I hope that they, that is part of their acknowledgement about the need for more transparency uh, around these uh, matters. 
Sentencing and decisions taken by the judiciary in individual cases it can often be seen as confusing by the public and victims, and we've heard some uh, of those very difficult cases raised this afternoon. Um, in the interim, I welcome uh, the setting up by the, the Justice Secretary of the Victims Task Force, the aims of which are to improve the experience of victims and witnesses through the justice system to help them understand and have their voices heard. I think that is very important. I'm very sympathetic to the arguments being uh, made this afternoon. I think it's been a good debate with a strong level of consensus. I believe the best way forward would be to establish a guideline which helps to deliver consistency of sentence and delivers justice, better protects victims, while also ensuring we protect the independence of the judiciary. Thank you very much. I move to closing speeches and I call Donald Cameron to close the Conservatives. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to close this debate for the Scottish Conservatives, not least because of my admittedly rare sorties into the criminal courts, so I did gain some professional experience of seeing sentencing a practice and its application in real life. And I'd like to thank Daniel Johnson for bringing forward not only a very important issue, but a pertinent one given uh, recent cases that have appeared in the media. I don't want to dwell on the specific case of Christopher Daniel, uh, which has been covered at length today. Uh, and as my colleague Liam Kerr and others across the chamber have stated, I certainly do not seek to criticize the judiciary or their independence. We all accept that ultimately it is the role of the judiciary acting at their discretion to determine sentences in the circumstances of any given specific case. That is paramount and indisputable. But as Liam Kerr said, that doesn't mean we can't question or develop sentencing policy in general, just as the Scottish Government is in terms of short sentences. The role of the Scottish Sentencing Council does deserve scrutiny. It was established in October 2015 to prepare guidelines for the courts and provide information to the public regarding sentencing. It's independent of government and has yet to issue any substantial guidelines beyond a general statement on the principles and purposes of sentencing. Now, everyone understands that thought and care is required when developing guidelines, but a time lag of six years from 2015 to 2021, from establishment to publication, is in my view too long. I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary said about the amount of work they do, but it's a question of priorities. Sentencing guidelines are the most important thing they do, given the fact that day in, day out, courts in Scotland are sentencing. And as Kezia Dugdale and Liam MacArthur said, we are right to register concern. No one is asking for rushed guidelines. If I just finished, no one is rush asking for rushed guidelines, but equally, there plainly needs to be a faster process. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I really do thank the member uh, for giving way. It's worth saying that the, there are guidelines that are currently being worked on by the council, such as, for example, uh, the sentencing process causing death by driving, sentences of young people. The member will accept if they have to reprioritise or deprioritise, uh, that will mean that some of the work that they're currently doing will have to be delayed uh, even further. Donald Cameron. I, I, I accept that there will, there will you know, they have to decide on what to prioritise. But in any event, in general terms, they must act faster. Uh, the only point I, I would like to make about the Christopher Daniel case is, is the one on undue leniency. Prosecutors felt they were unable to challenge the ruling on the basis of undue len leniency because the case didn't meet the high test required. And that reinforces, in our view on these benches, the need to revisit that test because of the troubling fact that even the exceptionally soft sanction of an absolute discharge for sexual assault of a child was determined by the Crown not to count as unduly lenient, and this therefore made it not worthy of a Crown appeal. We suggest that that test is overly restrictive and requires reconsideration. It's a test which is acknowledged as being difficult to meet. The respected Sheriff Frank Crow, writing in the Journal of the Law Society, said Crown appeals against sentence are infrequent since the test is a high one. And given its role in law reform, the Scottish Law Commission may be the appropriate body to investigate this and make recommendations. Because what is clear in this case and others, there are real issues with trust in our sentencing system, issues which hamper public confidence, as evidenced by figures last year which show that just over a third of Scots were confident that the system gives punishments which fit the crime. Issues which further increase apply to victims of serious offences, as evidenced by remarks from a representative of victim support last May to the Justice Committee that communities have no faith in community sentencing. The justice system should work for victims, not against them, and in sentencing, it should be more transparent. And in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I urge colleagues to support our amendment in Liam Kerr's name 
because it is clear that in a multitude of cases, the high legal test of undue leniency requires to be revisited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Hamza Youssef to close the government. Cabinet Secretary, four minutes, please. How many minutes, sorry? Six? Four? No, afraid oh, not. Geez, four. Oh, geez, right. You need to quick. be on your toes. I, I wanted to address the, 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 the motions. I, we cannot support the Conservative uh, motion. I do hear what the Conservative members have said. I think on, on, on reflection, I will also have a discussion uh, with the Scottish Law Commission on this uh, I, I, issue of, of, of undue leniency. But the reason uh, why I can't support, and I should say, is the same legal test in, in, in England uh, and, 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 and Wales uh, as well. But the reason why I, I, I can't support it uh, is because uh, of the particular cases and in in, in particular facts in a case are known by the sheriff and the judge uh, there. And in some cases, they will have to exercise leniency. Uh, for example, if there is a minor a first offence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the word here and the question here is around uh, unduly lenient. And, and an unduly lenient sentence is a sentence that is lenient to an unwarranted degree. Uh, and so it's appropriate for the ability to the, uh, for the appeal to be based on this legal test. However, I, I have heard what members here have said, and they have every right, of course, to ask the Scottish Law Commission uh, to, to examine this uh, and to look at this. Uh, but I do think, of course, there has to be a, a, a nuance between leniency uh, and, and unduly uh, lenient. I think we have to somewhat uh, recognise that. Um, I, I do, yes, uh, I will give way to Liam Kerr. Right. Liam Kerr. Uh, as brief as I can. Um, I'm simply asking the Cabinet Secretary to note the ability uh, to, the, to appeal may be hampered. Surely he can vote for that. Cabinet Secretary. I will reflect. I won't vote for it, but I will certainly reflect carefully on, on, on what he has to say in relation and the good points that I think he and other members have made on this. Uh, the Green motion wasn't uh, accepted, but I do really recognise the points that John Finney made in his contribution, but also his motion around judicial training is so important. And, and at the moment, actually, sheriffs and judges are receiving that training in relation to domestic abuse, uh, the offence that's coming into to, to play on, on, on the 1st of uh, April. Um, I, I just also wanted to make reference to some of the contributions made here and some of the questions that were asked. I thought Jenny Mara's speech uh, was, was well made and the points she made uh, well made. Also, I would say to Jenny Mara, um, she, she referenced the Lord Advocate and much of her contribution. She has every right, of course, if she hasn't done so already, to, to write to the Lord Advocate, to request a meeting from the Lord Advocate, to, 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 to demand an explanation, to request an explanation because the Lord Advocate is a member of this government and as I keep saying the, uh, well we all respect the independence of the judiciary and we do that there is a difference between independence and of course accountability and, and, and there should be that accountability uh, from the judiciary uh, yes very briefly I mean, Jenny Mara would the cabinet secretary agree with me that there's sufficient uh, public interest in the in the Daniel case that the Lord Advocate should provide clarity to the Parliament either by letter or by a statement. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, she'll, she'll forgive me, I, I will not go into the detail of a specific case, but I know that Liam Kerr did say that he received a response on the Daniels case from the Lord Advocate. Um, again, Jerry Mara could write to the Lord Advocate to, to, to ask uh, for that uh, same explanation. For Kezia Dugdale's uh, very considered uh, speech uh, as well, um, I was just giving one example. There are other examples of, of victim input into the Sentencing Council. Uh, one member of the Council, I should have said, uh, is, is specifically there to represent victims as a victim representative. In terms of her request to me, I can't demand the Council uh, to, to, to take forward a particular piece of work. I can ask and I can request. Uh, of course, I can request and I can uh, ask, and I will reflect very carefully on what members have said here uh, to take things forward. In terms of the specifics on, on murder and homicide, um, I did mention to her in the meeting that we had that the Scottish Law Commission, different to the Council, of course, is looking uh, at uh, the law around the murder and homicide, and I think it would make sense to wait for that in case there's any changes in the law, then for them to be an exploration of the guidelines. But I'm happy to take that offline and, and discuss that in further detail. Um, I, I am vastly uh, running uh, out uh, of time, but it's worth saying that the Council are uh, working on a number of guidelines uh, on sentencing process caused by uh, death, uh, death by driving and sentencing of young people. Um, if uh, members would want the Council to look to expedite the work on sexual offences, of course, something else would have to then be deprioritised. Uh, Thank so you. You must I will conclude. end on that point, uh, Thank and I you. hope that members will support our motion. I now call on Daniel Johnson to close for Labour till decision time, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking Fulton McGregor for holding me in such high regard, but I'd also like to thank members more generally, because I think this has been a very engaged debate, one that has not avoided difficult issues 
and I think one that has actually shed light on the topic at hand. I'd like to begin, I, mean, I think we've talked a lot about consistency, but transparency is equally important. I thought Kezia Dugdale's contribution was excellent because transparency isn't limited to sentencing guidelines. The sentences themselves and how they are communicated, whether or not sentences are actually uh, are what they state in, in terms of the automatic sentencing, and I think the Cabinet Secretary was right to point out to Conservatives who introduced that, but also in terms of the decisions made by the Parole Board, decisions around remand. Transparency is fundamental if we're going to ask people to have confidence in our justice system. But to the issues at hand, fundamentally, for me, the most important issue is one of equality. For an individual, to be treated differently because of his opportunities in life both to date and ahead of them is simply not right. For somebody who is a medical student to be treated differently to someone out of work is not something that we can countenance. And of course we need to look at the individual and indeed we must hold them responsible for the decisions that they've made but can we hold them responsible and treat them differently because of the opportunities they may or may not have had in life. And indeed, I would make the wider point, I think in a sense, treating someone more leniently because of the education they have or are about to receive is the wrong way round. Someone with a greater degree of education should be held to a higher degree of account than someone with less. And so quite simply this, there is a danger, a very real danger, that there is a sense that if you are poor, you'll be treated more harshly by our justice system. And that is something that we cannot abide, not on these benches, not in this parliament, not in this country. And there is a potential wider issues, because if you look at the criminal proceeding statistics that were recently uh, released, there were a number of cases where of homicide and sexual assault, where fines and absolute discharge were, what the, 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 uh, uh, were given to the individuals. And I think we have to ask ourselves, why? And the problem is we do not have confidence without guidelines and without the more detailed comparative statistics to be able to have confidence that those were justified. And I would like to address the, the other uh, amendments which have been tabled this afternoon. To the government's amendment, I welcome the fact that they note the length of time that it has taken to produce the guidelines so far. I think that is important. I think it is right that we hold the Sentencing Council to account. But I do think we have to reflect the disappointment and the fact that we will be letting victims down if we do not bring forward guidelines. And so for those reasons, I cannot support the government's uh, amendment this evening. And to the Conservatives, I have some sympathy with the issues that they are raising. I think we do have to look at how the tests of undue leniency, but I think the general characterization of sentences being too lenient is one that I think we have to take great care of. The reality is, over the last three to four decades, sentences have been going up. I'm not convinced the evidence overall for sentences being more lenient is there. And I'm, in a sense, um, I think it is a shame that the Green Amendment was not taken. We would not have voted for it because it wiped out an important part of our uh, motion. But I think the point around judicial training is one that is well made and one that in broad terms I would support. Indeed, I think the points around judicial independence, and I think this is very much the, the, one of the, the more uh, complex issues and awkward issues in this debate, is an important one. And I would like to remind members that we don't just have a moral duty to uphold the independence of the judiciary, we have a legal responsibility to uphold it. But I do think it's important that we do not avoid issues which arise out of individual court cases because, and in, in the end of the day, individual court cases can uh, reveal issues that need discussed. And if uh, this uh, parliament has any function at all, it's to provide a forum for discussing issues which are of public concern. And in particular, there is a role for government and for parliament with regard to sentencing. If, if we did not have that, we would not be discussing whether or not short, short sentences should be presumed uh, for, or we, should, we would not be discussing whether or not uh, non-custodial sentences should be promoted, such as community payback orders. I'd just like to end by looking at and considering Lady Dorian's comments. And I hold Lady Dorian in very high regard. I think she is absolutely a voice of progress in our courts, and I welcome very much uh, many of the things that she's brought Can forward. Keep the noise down, please. And, and I would agree, we do need to take time and not rush. But I don't think we're asking the Scottish Sentencing Council to rush. Last year alone, the, the Sentencing Council in England and Wales produced seven sentencing guidelines. 
And can I make another point, which is, consider this. In this place, we take a, a matter of months to pass legislation that the Scottish Sentencing Council is saying it requires them years to think about providing guidelines uh, to sentencers as to how to sentence for them. Surely that is slightly awry. So I would agree with both Liam MacArthur and Shora Robertson that there is uh, something uh, to be looked at in the time they're taking. And I think in particular because of the significant increase in historic sexual crimes that are now being considered in our High Court, I think there is actually a very real and pressing need to have guidelines because of this big increase to make sure that we get those decisions right, that we get those sentences right, and that those people are punished for the crimes that they have committed in the past. In the end, this is an argument about equality, about fairness, and making sure that everyone can understand and consent to the functioning of our justice system. And I hope uh, members will support our motion this evening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And that concludes our debate on justice. Uh, the next item is consideration of business motion 16025 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. And could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member uh, seems to wish to speak on the motion. Therefore, I call. The question is that motion 16025 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item is consideration of uh, five parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day, on behalf of the bureau, to move motions 16026, 16027, 16028, 16029, and that's on approval of an SSI and 16037 on a committee meeting at the same time as Parliament. Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. We turn to decision time. Could I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs will fall. So the first question is that amendment 16012.3 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville, which seeks to amend motion 16012 in the name of Mark Griffin on the carer's allowance supplement be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16012.3 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville is yes, 65, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Miles Briggs is therefore preempted. And the next question is that motion 16012 in the name of Mark Griffin, as amended, on the carer's allowance supplement, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16012 in the name of Mark Griffin as amended is yes, 93, no, 28. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 16013.3 in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend motion 16013 in the name of Daniel Johnson on justice be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 16013.3 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 61, no 54. There are six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 16013.2 in the name of Liam Kerr, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Daniel Johnson on justice be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16013.2 in the name of Liam Kerr is yes 27, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 16013 in the name of Daniel Johnson as amended on justice be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16013 in the name of Daniel Johnson on justice as amended is yes 94, no 21. There were six abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now I propose to ask a single question on the five parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? No, that's good. The question is that motions 16026, 16027, 16028, 16029 and 16037 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Emma Harper on Eating Disorders Week, Eating Disorders Awareness Week. But we're just going to take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. A few moments.